All right, and we're back with uh, with Brian, and I. Oh, Bucklew, sorry. Bucklew. My brain. Good every afternoon. time I've I've read it so many times, and my brain says Buckley every time, and I can't stop it. <laughs> That's why I struggle every single time. Um, so, uh, how do shields work? Um, shields can be used a finite number of times a turn, and they increase your AV for the hit that they proc. Right. Okay. So they're, and they're like it a used to be that only your best shield could work, but so many people wanted to have a mutant with eight shields that we made that work. So each shield has like a lower percent chance of proccing against the next hit. But like you, you can only use a shield against one attack a turn typically. So like if you have more shields, is it just increasing the chance of blocking with a shield? Um, I don't, I don't know how that works. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> it's, ch it's changed a few times. <laughs> I forget if you, if you only have one chance or if you can block more than one attack with a shield. I thought, I thought it was finally going to have the uh, end of this no, one. Sorry. No one actually knows how that works. All right. All right. Good to know. I had written here, as long as you wield a shield, there is a 50% chance you block one melee attack per round. Does this mean wielding a buckler is better than putting it on your arm? Um, it just depends. I don't think, like, it depends on what slot you want to give up. Well, I, I guess what I really mean is it specifies wield. No, the, it doesn't matter what she, what slot the shield is in. All right. So I finally have lost this argument, and I'm glad because I did. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. All right. That was basically my only mechanical question. Yeah, let's see. If... If you have shield wall and the shield's worn on your hand, so you can only use shield wall with it in your hand. Otherwise, your chance is 25 plus your improved block stat. If you have shield block, it's 25% more. And if you have depth blocking, it's 25% more. Um... That sounds like it increases the chance. And I think you can block once per turn per shield. Oh, per shield. Yeah, I think if you have a bunch of shields. But that only matters if, shield. if uh, that only matters if something can attack multiple times per turn. I feel like surrounded or something. Yeah. Oh right, I, I, right. Okay. Um. Yeah. So if you're taking multiple attacks per turn. Yeah. So I at, think that's how it works. At this point, having multiple shields is actually not a bad thing. No, no. It, it's a, you're a little for a long time. It didn't matter. Only your highest shield counted, and people like were so set on having a bunch of shields that we were like, we should make that it better to have shields. So we did. So it is. It is strictly better though marginally to have a bunch of shields versus just one shield. Um, I know there's a mod. For this, and uh, I know, like pretty much every feature suggestion flies under the umbrella of like sounds like a good mod. So this is probably already covered. But is was there was there or is there ever going to be plans for doing something similar with like pistols or missile weapons? Um, do it with similar in what way? In the sense that if you have multiple arms, you can wield multiple missile weapons and fire all of them and to. Uh, well, I mean, you can you can do that. You 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 can wield a ton of rifles if you in like especially if you're a true kin with a gun rack. It's not quite as easy as just getting additional hands, but you certainly can wield an absolute crap ton of missile weapons if you play it play it right. I I maybe I'm my my knowledge is outdated. I always thought that that was still something like you you would only ever have the left and right missile weapon. Oh no! You can, there are there are ways in game to get more. <laughs> I'll say that much. Okay. All right. That that pretty much covers that. So, um, <laughs> just like covering all of the, the you know, uh, what else am I wrong about and have been wrong about for the, like the last two years, basically. I really um, don't know because the stuff changes enough that. I have memories over the last 15 years and not all of them are true anymore. So yeah, I, I got a little bit of a layer cake in my head. I, uh, I recently started a, a 5e game and, um, or D and D 5e. And 
um like i was making all kinds of really stupid obvious mistakes uh like gming it because it's like oh you can just five foot step right no oh you get flanking right no you don't get flanking <laughs> like all yep. of this is third and and uh, 3.5 additions and and it's like and then i actually read the 5e combat is like wow this game is actually really simple um they simplified a lot of it. They simplified you know, that's a lot necessarily of it. a bad thing. I it's... tend to be pretty fast and loose with the rules when playing D and D, and then it gets. Yeah, I guess I was. I like. Um, I often say that I I have been indoctrinated into using minis in a battle map because I my preferred method for D and D is like theater of mind and like, just, like coming up with interesting or uh you know solutions to to combat rather than like playing combat, um. So having like realized this, I was like, oh, I'm kind of bummed out that all of these things I've been forced to learn are no longer true. And, you know, it's, it's all just like outdated tech. Um, but anyway, sorry. Um, so I was going to talk uh, or ask some questions about like Caves of Cud now as a hot pot of development versus i think it this is true but I, I just for confirmation originally it was it was just you and jason right it was just me and jason for many years um till, till around 2017 or 2018. okay um it doesn't i don't know if it matters too much but like what like what would you see say was like the first addition to the the cud team um and in fact it probably was more like 2016 um when oh it's so hard to remember this now it is it's like going starting to go on 10 years ago but um in fact the first the first member of the team outside of us was probably sam and she's forgive me if i'm getting this wrong the person who was actually the first member of the team but this is the way i remember it right now um is when we went on steam we needed tiles and a bunch of people submitted tiles and sam's tiles are just out of this world um and so sam started making tiles and that must have been in 2016 um because that happened pretty fast after the steam release um and then it was probably craig working on the music oh yeah yeah, yeah. um and then sometime after that chaos kaylin and um corey joined uh and later arm arm of egg and so now the team is like fairly big um with all those people still being mainline contributors um to, to most of the most of the big big patches so i, I just so i get my facts right because i i'd like to have a rough idea of like what um what you can roughly attribute to each member um, I know, I know Kaylin's covering a lot of, uh, like stories and quests and stuff like that. Um, or at least like, um, cooperating in terms like that, you know, she's yeah, Kaylin does, uh, Kaylin does, uh, quite a lot of design and writing, um, on, on the quests and for characters also does a lot of the writing for Patreon pets. And, um, C Craig does the music, uh, Sam right. does the tiles. That's right. Narf's working on, uh, or Corey is working on uh, the, the mostly the input manager, as I understand it, and like uh, UI stuff. Corey's actually done a lot of work on on the UI accessibility and usability stuff. Um, that's that's most of, and like modding in general. Uh, uh, though, though, I mean, Corey's a, a very skilled technical contributor generally. <laughs> And uh, sorry, I, I, I'm laughing because Corey's tried to teach me coding and, and uh, bless them for having patience with me. But uh, yes, <laughs> like there's, it's just like a different, like, you know, it, it's sort of like, uh, you know, someone coming down and like, be not afraid. And, and I'm just trying to like rub some sticks together. Um, but uh, so I know so chaos has done some it, of the like items and some of the more like technical mechanical stuff chaos has done a huge amount of work inside the engine doing cleanup and in fact um most of the bug fixes and and small features that you get every week on friday are chaos um which chaos sort of blocks for the rest of the team to work on longer term 
long-term features behind the scenes. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, a lot of the time. Um, and so just generally fixing a lot of the issues that come up and refactoring insides of the engines to support future uh, work and uh, building a lot. I mean, like a lot of the existing systems in the game have been either elaborated on or written um, entirely by chaos at this point. Um, so like reality stabilization is all chaos and the power grid system is all chaos's work. Um, so wow. building, you know, I, I, for a long time, I, you know, I built this whole engine. It was, you know, chaos, chaos is sort of, inherited it and built on those baseline systems and a lot of the a lot of the modern systems now are chaos um and then armathag is is newer though still like a pretty senior member of the team armathag actually develops hearthpire um and so is very familiar with the internals internals of the engine um and has and has helped build some of the newer systems like the the um, redacted system at the end of the current main quest where you go on a little construction adventure. I don't know if you've have you played the the end of the current main quest. So actually, no. Um... Okay, well, I won't spoil it. But there there's there are some there the the game the day, game doesn't stop presenting new systems to you even even to the very end of the game right now. So you'll you'll there's there there are whole new systems and Armathag has has built um, a couple of the big ones that you run in in the end game right now. Yeah, I um I. I, I was so I, I knew about Hearthpire. I didn't I, I haven't done a series that included Hearthpire because I tend to roll with mostly quality of life features um, yeah. and wanted to stay mostly vanilla in terms of gameplay. Um, I, I we can talk about that, but like it's just the matter of fact of it. Um, but I did know about Hearthpire and, and it was like that that would be the the first like content mod I would install uh, in addition to psionic weapons because that's just badass. Um. And then then in, then in addition to those team members, um, Polak Rasky, who's not a a, a, a full time member but did the, all the UI work that we base our current UI work on. Um, he did mock ups for the whole game. Um, oh Turkish right, UI designer. Um, and then we're currently working with a shell in the pit, which is a which is an independent um, sound design studio. Uh, they did like Goose Game; they're amazing. Um, but they're doing the the modern sound effect work um, that's been making into making its way into the game. Uh, we got a quite a bit of more of that queued up for the next big patch. Working on behind the scenes. I, I would, uh, I I have to say that's probably some of my favorite stuff. Because it's just like it, it puts so much life into the world when you have like, I don't know, it, it kind of like gives agency to specific events, you know? Yeah, yeah so they've, I, done, they've done really amazing work. Cut is not an easy game to make sound for. It's 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 pretty unusual. It's like fairly repetitive in the things that are happening. So um, the sound needs to be sparse but textured and, and feel sufficiently good against Craig's amazing ambient. <laughs> Uh, music and so it's 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 quite challenging but they're they're really they're really serving up good stuff yeah i uh like it, it's only been it's only been good stuff i i've i've been really enjoying the the like small like i i wouldn't say small but like they're like not even quite quality of life it's sort of like quality of life for environmentals like it it, it just makes the game feel a bit more alive well which which is cud Cud really leans into just atmosphere in a lot of ways. And, you know, despite being like a very simple sort of almost text-based presentation, um, I think we do really build a real atmosphere. And so the sounds really have to serve, serve that atmosphere. Um, and anything we can do to, to make that atmosphere even more immersive is is good for Cud, I think. It's not a throwaway thing. Like sinking into the world and sort of inhabiting it is, is the big thing Cud does well. Yeah, and I and like, you know, not to just be like, um, I don't know, aggrandize. I don't know if that's the right word, but like to to, you know, boast on Cud's features. Um, I really get the sense that like nothing is added or uh, that doesn't contribute to it to that conversation. Like to to Cud, nothing like I you know, and I've played like a lot of indie games for you know to cover for my channel and i i definitely come across a lot of games where it's like i don't understand what like x y and z feature contributes or you know like 
it, it's it seems really easy for people to get distracted away from what makes it good and what's really this difficult... is something this is this is something that Jason does very well, which is which is play a production role. Um, there's there's a lot of like very creative people in the game um, that want to just sort of add add everything to it, and and that works for a lot of games, right? Like you get like CDDA. There's just like everything in that game, <laughs> which is fine. I you know it's it's own aesthetic, but um, cut is much more precious, like you say, about what makes it in, um, and a lot of that is just about have like somebody holding a vision for for what kinds of what the shape of the things that you'd make it in and uh you know they're like a bunch of us uh, you know chaos will build a big cool system and it's big and cool and and you know it, it on on its own um but some sometimes those things are pushed off and made into mods or or just deferred for some future time because it just doesn't fit the shape of the kind of game we're making right now um, and, that, and that's that's those are really tough um producerial calls uh, that that largely Jason makes. That's uh, heavily touching on something I was gonna. I, I definitely wanted to jump into, but let's let's go through things in um, a semi chronological way here. Um, uh, is okay. Hold on a second. Uh, oh yeah. So. Um. So has growing from like two people to an actual team been challenging at all, or like is it something? Have there been ups and downs, or has it mostly been ups? It's mostly been ups. I, it, it can be hard for some teams. Both Jason and I are old hands inside enterprise software. Uh, I spent a couple decades uh, with a in a startup that I co-founded in the late '90s um, that grew into a big company and got sold and got sold again. Um, <laughs> where I played, where I was in a leadership, technical leadership, and business leadership position. Um, so like the scale of freehold is not challenging with respect to managing the people and the people are all just amazing. They all, they all have showed up because they really love the thing and they, you know, they, they, they see places that they can, they can improve it. And so like the, the people are all amazing. But the tough thing about it is that games is a tough business. Um, and so, you know, most of us are working part time after other jobs. And, you know, it's always it's always a challenge to the, to put the resourcing together to pay everybody what they need to be paid to, to live. Yeah, that goes for all of us. Um, but like, on the other hand, we're I, like for a little indie game, especially a little text game, indie game, we're way out on the long tail of the, the amount of success you can have. We, we do have a little bit of, of money to work with, so everybody does get paid a little bit. Um, and I'd say that's the challenging thing, not not managing the team, but rather just, you know, it would be amazing if we could just all work full time. I think we would do that just 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 great. Um, but but we don't we don't have the income to do that at the moment. I um, like I don't know on the on the list of, of things that like are wrong with the world. I think that that, that would be on my high the high end of my list. But, I mean, uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mind making a living doing it. We don't. We don't quite get there, but you know, we 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 certainly have a lot more resources than a lot of other indie teams. I guess. Um, so we just. Just so it doesn't sound like I'm saying, yeah, the the thing that's wrong with the world is that I don't get my video game is uh, in a broad stroke sense that we don't get to have like amazing things made because we have to contend with some kind of artificial structure that we decided was the correct one. I mean, I'm not even sure what I mean, is it an artificial structure? I think it's the question of like what the market will pay for, right? Like I, that's you know, the people, one I'm talking about. <laughs> pe pe people will pay for games as a service. And so that's what they get, right? Like, yeah, um, I think I think Caves of Cut has existed uh, successfully in part because we adhere a little bit to a game of games as a service model. We patch every Friday, right? Um, we have big content releases every three months. We're a little, we're a little, we, we haven't patched for a little bit. It's been, it's been about six months because we were working on some stuff behind the scenes um, that wasn't the game. But well, that cadence will come back here um, pretty soon. We're, 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 we're back in the swing of things. Um, but that like constant, Constant update cycle has kept interest sustained in the game for, you know, eight years or something on Steam so far. Our, our user base is over the long term growing, not shrinking. Um, our CCU is up, you know, many fold over the years. And so, you know, I think 
it's 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 tough right like the the pressure is to make a these sort of like semi-abusive online games that get you back in there and buying stuff on stores and are free to play on the surface and fish for whales and <laughs> just you know caves of cud lives in the space where we don't have big studios competing with us because none of them can make this kind of game so there just aren't many games like this. Every, every one of those big studios would love to make a game like this, but you just can't fund it, right? You can't fund it on that scale. Yeah. And so there, there are very few experiences like this where we're able to sort of eke out a liminal existence in the ecosystem because, you know, we, we found a place where we could make enough money to live, um, partly because nobody's dumping $200 million into this kind of game. <laughs> I mean, not many studios, at least. Hold on, I might die. No, I'm good. Maybe. I have found that, uh, I don't know if this is a recent thing, but I have found that I my my lad will not replace the torch automatically yeah, sometimes. Yeah, that's some kind of new auto equip behavior. <clears throat> um, okay. Uh, okay, so that covers a lot of stuff about um, the team. Has the core concept of CUD changed over the years? I think um, I think it's been relatively stable. I think that stuff that's changed is just our own sort of personal development. It's become more rich just because our understanding of the way you build games and the way history works has become richer. And it just reflects both the increasing age and maturity of the team and the size and diversity of the team, right? Like me, me and Jason are like, couple suburban this white dudes who didn't really have yeah i mean you know we we aren't particularly diverse between the two of us and our team has become increasingly diverse and i think that really serves cud which is in part a game about sort of like the different ways to take apart an identity and pull them back together right like i, I think that that bigger team um, that's significantly more diverse than it was 10 years ago is, is, is a powerful one. All right. Yeah. I mean that I, n not, n not, not, um, not a lot of this is a surprise to me. Um, but I, I, I like to get these things because, um, they might honestly answer some questions for people that, you know, like are, are just jumping into this and want to know more. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't talk a lot about it on like the team and stuff online it's not sort of our our thing right like we we kind of quietly build build our build our thing so i'm happy to happy to share i'm gonna check it's out this uh named pretty, location it's been pretty wonderful to be a part of i feel pretty fortunate i i mean like and i think that that shows i like i they definitely get a sense that there's no no feature or nook and cranny uh in cud was made with resentment or like you know maybe exhaustion for sure but like it doesn't oh good lord um <laughs> hold on i wonder if i can deploy a turret here nope never mind i guess i'm wielding it i should get some more turrets um yeah nothing nothing feels like it was like you know like oh we got to push out an update this week so you know let's yeah, we, we've been fortunate enough to be able to take our time and make the game we really want to make, which I think is the only way CUD's going to succeed, right? It succeeds because it's competing against the sea of games that had to come out in six months, right? Had, had like, we're very reasonably cleaving to capital pressure to release in a particular way at a particular time. You know, we we were lucky enough to be in a situation where we can build it a different way, and we did. You know, and I think that 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 contributes a lot to its success. But a lot of that is like just pure for good fortune, right? Like Jason and I having supportive families and good enough careers outside of Caves of Cud, and all those things that allow us to 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 like take the extra time. Um. Yeah. All right. So, uh, okay. Uh, you pretty much answered the next one. Um, okay. Here's a, here's a good one. Uh, and oh, the, no, never mind. I thought there was. We were 
further than we were. Uh, what is a good example of a feature or mechanic that surprised you, meaning you had no idea it had been added? Um, I mean, a lot... Nowadays, I work a lot on the user interface and don't don't keep track of every single thing that get, gets added, so a lot of it comes as a surprise to me <laughs> when I engage with it, because it's like... Uh, if you're talking about me personally, like all of the writing for the end game quests happens between Jason and Kaylin and the implementation I'm not doing. So when, if when I go engage with some of those quests for the first time, it's all as new to me as it is for a player. That must be like a really like I, I'm just trying to imagine like um, I mean, this is this is something that you have been like intimately involved with for a number of years. And now you're getting to like play it with fresh eyes like you get to actually play the game for the first time in in some ways yeah the game is like is pretty wild <laughs> there, there's a there's a lot of stuff in this game um and and it's it's like it's hard for me to imagine what the experience dropping into this game with fresh eyes would be it seems like it would be just kind of nuts Um, I'm actually like, I wouldn't say I'm new to the game, but in the grand scheme of things, I came in before, I think I came in before Bela, but like yeah. only barely. Um, so for me, like, honestly, Bela is probably, is, is canon to cut. Like that was my canonical experience. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, I have a pretty, pretty solid memory of narf showing me like this is this is the new quest in cud and it's like it's really cool you got to check it out and uh that was kind of in many ways like my first like oh wow this game is something different for sure um so i i like to consider myself new but probably at this point i don't know anymore what what does it matter i suppose but um yeah, you know, that's that's really interesting. So like, yeah, you're you're playing like large portions of the game that are like completely new to you. Yeah. Um, all right. So. OK, so here's I, I, I like I like this one. Has there been ever been like you mentioned you talked about this very briefly and I'm, I'm just kind of interested in and feel free to, to forgo this or, or opt out. Um, uh, have there been features that have been suggested that you or Jason had to stonewall refuse like that's just not appropriate oh, all the time. I mean, <laughs> nice. uh, like, <laughs> like everybody on the team is hugely creative. Uh, if we put everybody, all of everybody's ideas in, into the game, it would sprawl very quickly. Um, and so we have like huge buckets of topical, uh, of ideas and even implementations that are bucketed for future releases where we can, we can put, um, the right framing deliver them in sort of a themed package maybe at some point in a future patch or dlc or, or you know whatever it is down the road uh, but there's there's just a huge amount of of content that ends up being not implemented or cut that gets suggested or even partly built uh, that was well, actually every week, every week basically so I, ideas are showing up that we were like oh well we don't have a scope for, scope for that. That should be post 1.0. That's something for maybe a patch or a <laughs> DLC about plants or whatever it happens to be. Amazing. You, you heard it here first. Plants DLC confirmed. Plants DLC. Oh, I mean, I was going to ask about that because you mentioned like CUD as a uh, as a games as a service is a very um, surprising thing for me to hear because like I, I, I understand where you're coming from with it, but um i i guess i never read as like uh there's there's still interest in the game meaning you're you're getting a uh a, like a a source of income from it because you don't really like make a sustained income from cud it's just from the initial purchase of the game yeah, so right. um is it really just like word of mouth that people are like talking about it that it leads to new purchases of the game yeah, I mean, it's like ongoing ongoing people talking about it that feeds into Steam showing it to people. That, you know, people see a well-reviewed game, right? And they're in a lull. There's never quite enough video games. New, <laughs> people, 
new people that are were born weren't born when we started the game are now 14 and looking for a new video game right um i think the upside of cut is that it it was it has never been chasing a cutting edge of presentation even when it was brand new and released in 2010 it looked like an old game right like it, it at least looked like not a new game right um but it's compelling anyway but that means that it's a little timeless um to the extent that somebody is aging out of games either because they, they they're looking for something more complex or they're literally just getting older and looking for something with a little a little more crunch um caves of cut is there for them i you know i hope that it'll continue to be for there for them 15 years from now right i don't, I don't think if we do our job right that there's any reason that somebody's not buying caves of cud in you know 2040 because they want something new same way you would pick up a book that's still 40 years old and and give it a read because there's still value there but have you ever like has there ever been a discussion about like I mean, we could probably do like a cosmetics pack or something like that, or, or like yeah, digital. sure. I mean, I mean, I think I think we have to ship 1.0 first. Um, I don't think anybody wants to do any kind of additional paid content before we ship 1.0. Some games do go that way. I don't think we have to. Um, I think post 1.0, we've got options, right? Um, you could continue to just build on it forever. It kind of depends on how well launch goes. Um, You've got all kinds of options for DLC or not DLC, baking into the game, or simply making a sequel. Uh, I don't. We may we haven't made any kind of hard decisions there. Um, we're still pretty focused on getting 1.0 to market. On a like purely selfish basis, I I kind of like I wouldn't say hope, but the the idea of a sequel to Cud honestly scares me because <laughs> it's like it's such a it's such a behemoth of a game like it's so large uh yeah. i can't imagine like being able to follow up with with something and it's like any feature that i would want like me personally out of a sequel um could probably be crammed into the, the initial um without much without hurting it much i suppose outside of like oh yeah we're gonna make it 3d uh, that but that doesn't i don't think that would yeah, actually contribute think... anything I mean, I think you, I think you could, I think you could, for example, spend a bunch of money in development effort and actually make a more modern um, presentation that that makes the game accessible to a wider range of people. Um, but it would be a big build. But I don't know if that's just Caves of Cud. That might be, you know, it might be, that might be a new game with a bunch of Cud content, right? Like essentially taking taking what is Cud and putting it in a different shell. Um, and so I, you know, what does that look like? I don't know. That's not that's not a product proposal. It's just the you know the reality that that that's a potential shape for something in the future. What we actually do, I don't know. Nice. Well, um, that actually like really conveniently leads to um, the next subject I wanted to jump into, which was uh, ambition. But we're at the end of our episode, so uh, I really hope I don't die again at the end of this episode because I've died consistently. <laughs> no, stop. I pressed the wrong button. I fat fingered it. Oh, God. Hold on. Let me just uh, see if I can salvage this. All right. Let's, let's hope that's enough. It probably won't be. Wounded, badly wounded. All right. My death is near. Uh, if only I had wings. I knew I should have looked for our, the, the the flattened remains. It's just it's too good not to. Um. Hmm. All right. Here's a good question. What would you do in this sitch? I would run. I would definitely not be adjacent to two baboons. I would try to get to, so I was adjacent to one baboon, so I would back off. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> oh, you're in such a bad spot. Then I might, I might try to, I might try to step up to the northwest. You are running. 
And there you go. So now you're only adjacent to one baboon. And now I might try to live. How badly wounded are they? Are they? How badly wounded they are? Uh, perfect. Perfect. And injured. Yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah. If I had yeah. an extra turn, uh, I would try a love injector on them. I would probably love injector that one. You'll probably live one a turn. What is, I actually don't know what what does it do to yourself? You don't apply it to yourself. Oh, you apply mean like to you, that bed bone. you would equip click it? it? Click it. Click it. No, no, no. Click it. All right. Go in here. Click it. Click the love injector. Yeah. Go apply to. Oh, I never... And then click that baboon. Can I just do direction? Yeah, or... you can just do right. Yeah, I mean... Does not want to love injector applied to... Oh, her. yeah, so you have to put it in your... Put it in your... Your hand. And as soon as I equip hand. it, I'm gonna die. Nah. Yeah, stick it in your primary hand and, and escape out. Now attack him. I died. Oh, you died. <laughs> Good try. You missed. Had you hit with that love injector, you they would have had a, a baboon showdown. Well, luckily there wasn't too much gain there. I did gain a couple of levels, but eh. that, uh, that's a pretty rough name location. Lots of baboons and uh, legendaries on that first floor. Um, I'm at level eight. I, I guess I'll ask before we get to the next episode, like, where would you like, is there a specific place you'd like to talk about? um that i should get, try and get to or i don't have anything any preference i don't think mm -hmm. okay well then i'll just like continue kind of like slugging towards uh towards like the story progression okay um, yeah i think i should probably wrap it up for today okay all right well um if you've enjoyed uh this episode in our talk uh with uh brian uh again my brain uh, Bucklew, then uh, definitely hit the like uh, the like button and consider subscribing for more content like this. I'll see you guys next time. Is there anything you want to add to this? Oh, it's been fun. Look forward to the next one. Awesome. Take it easy.